Hello and welcome, independent researchers, skeptics, and all of humankind, the shadow citizen. Welcome to episode 15 with returning guest James Perloff. Today's scheduled guest, Joyce Riley of the Power Hour, had to cancel due to her health. I've listened to the Power Hour for more than a decade, and Joyce rarely takes time off, so uh, she's not doing well, so please you know, send her her positive healing energy. You can listen to us live, our live broadcast, and chat along with us over at mixlr.com slash forward shadow citizen. We are also simulcast on radioconfluence.com, and from there you can take us with you on TuneIn and Xeno Live. For a schedule of upcoming guests and past archives, please check out our website, shadowcitizen.online. And now we have cool merchandise and a fan page of people you know, sending in pictures, so we really appreciate that. My name is Rob O'Sell, and my co-host is Rachel L. McIntosh. And once again, we're welcoming... James Perloff. This is his third appearance on The Shadow Citizen, and I think he deserves a mug. I think he should get, we're going to send him a mug. Oh, we got, yeah, we got to send him a yeah, mug for yeah, sure. Send him a mug. <laughs> so we're going to send him a mug, and we'll hopefully get a picture of him on our fan page. It'll be awesome. Um, oh. James, as most people that are listening to our show know, he's an exquisite researcher. He is a historian. And I'm, I'm always very, very impressed with his deep knowledge of his, historical facts and how they relate to the current events. Um, right now, James is going to talk to us about Syria. And I think this is important based on what we're witnessing and how we're, you know, being prompted that we're at the edge of World War III because of Syria. So, James, thanks for being with us. Thank you. And... Uh... I also want to uh, just pay tribute to Joyce Riley, who I'm filling in for today. Um, she did have a, um, uh, a, she obviously had a guest uh, host on today, uh, and they, people were calling in to pay tribute to her. It appears that she may be near the end and in pain from um, terminal cancer. Uh, certainly want to encourage people to pray for her, pray for recovery, um, pray for God's comfort for her. Yeah. She she yeah. has been such a trooper. I mean, uh, she has shared mm-hmm. this journey with all of her listeners, and she tells, you know, about the different treatments she goes through. And, you know, she's just really such a hard worker. She rarely, rarely takes time off, so you could tell, you know, something was up with this. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, prayers I, I really wanted her on so that we could get an inside view into what got her into doing this. I mean, considering that this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. And I wanted to know her story, what she got into, how she got into it and what powered her to keep doing this, even as she's, as she's dying. And I thought it would be interesting. And I really, really hope, I really hope that she's okay right now, whatever's happening to her. I know that she's in God's hands and she's going to be okay, but it's sad for me. Yeah. I think she was uh, motivated by a, a deep conviction and sense of righteousness. Yeah. Seeing all, all the evil and deceit that surrounds us in this world. Yeah. <sighs> so we will focus ourselves to helping her message of uncovering the truth and letting people know what's going on. We're going to continue that. So let's continue on. James, tell us what you have to say. You came in with an idea to talk about Syria. So where do you want to start with that? Yeah, I wrote an article. It's my latest blog post on jamesproloff.com. Uh, it's called Trump is Unmasked, 14 Reasons Why the Syria Airstrikes Were a Really Bad Idea. And uh, it's funny, I when I mentioned that post to you, you said, oh, you narrowed it down to 14. Yeah, <laughs> right? Just 14, James? Wow. Yeah. So okay. let's talk about the 14 and let's talk about what this means about Donald Trump. And the first uh, reason these were a bad idea was that Trump contradicted himself. And, um, you know, I I picked these things up on Twitter, but I uh, 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 screenshot some of Trump's own tweets. And this goes back to 2013 when Obama was contemplating airstrikes on Syria over sarin gas. Exact same Mm -hmm. situation, right? So let's read some of his tweets. This is from 29 August 2013. Quote, when will we get what will we get for bombing Syria besides more debt? 
and a possible long-term conflict. Obama needs congressional approval, unquote Donald Trump. That's only good advice. Uh, next one, I'm just going to give you five of the 13 that were uh, posted. Um, quote, if Obama attacks Syria and innocent civilians are hurt and killed, he and the U.S. will look for a bad, unquote. I should mention that civilians were killed by his airstrikes. Um, next one, uh, if the U.S. attacks Syria and hits the wrong targets, killing civilians, there will be worldwide hell to pay. Stay away and fix broken U.S., um, this next one's from 5 September 2013, quote, the only reason President Obama wants to attack Syria is to save face over his very dumb red line statement. Do not, capital letters, not attack Syria, fix the USA, unquote Donald Trump. And this last one, all in caps, quote, again, to our very foolish leader, do not attack Syria. If you do, many very bad things will happen. And from that fight, the U.S. gets nothing, exclamation point, unquote. And that was from 5 September 2013. It was retweeted over 82,000 times. So people, that, that message resonated with people. So we see that Trump did something that he himself knew was a bad idea. That's yeah. reason number one. That's number one. Do you think, you know, that everybody's trying to figure out, they're trying to guess if, you know, Trump just bamboozled everybody on the way in or, you know, or and... You know, he planned that. He bamboozled us. <laughs> he bamboozled us. Or do you think, uh, you know, he, he was shown the film of the JFK assassination from an angle nobody has seen before? You know, it's like, that's the old uh, Bill Hicks uh, comedy line, you know, that that's why all the presidents change once they're in office. So, but, you know, if he did uh, bamboozle everybody, I mean, he was so, you know, uh, well, I don't know. I never trusted the guy in the first place. And, uh, I didn't vote for him or Hillary, so I guess uh, I can't take credit. You're or blame. free and clear, Rob. You're free and clear. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. Neither did I, and we we talked about that. But um, I think that he just really wanted to be remembered as an important person. I think he has an ego that drove him to want to be president, so that he'd be in the history books. And I think that he played the game that everybody that gets to be president played. That's what I think. Yeah, I think he had Rothschild IOUs that drove him to become president. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I voted for him. I was the only one of the three here that did vote for him. I was hopeful. I felt that, uh, you know, anybody who's watched my, uh, my, my blog or especially my Twitter feed where I had, uh, I, I go back over the memes, uh, you know, of a, 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 a collection of memes I did, and Hillary is in there like, six times more than any other individual. Um, so I was very much against the Hillary Clinton presidency for all the, uh, you know, the corruption, lying, warmongering, and other reasons we know about her. Hopeful that Trump would live up to his rhetoric, but he didn't. Yeah. But number two uh, on my list of the 14 reasons is that uh, he uh, acted unconstitutionally. And I'm just going to quote what uh, Rand Paul uh, tweeted after that Syria missile strike. It said, quote, uh, the president needs congressional authorization for military action as required by the Constitution, unquote. And you might recall in Trump's first tweet that I quoted, he said that you need congressional approval. And if you look at the, uh, the Constitution, it does say that the president is in command of the armed forces. But as far as war making goes, it gives the, the right to declare war and raise armies. That's all given to Congress. And it's unfortunate that the Founding fathers didn't spell out more specifically the the limitations on a president's power, but they were always about checks and balances. And clearly, this was war making, which is only uh, war making power is only given to Congress in the Constitution. And if anybody doesn't think that that was making war, if somebody launched fifty nine missiles on us, I guarantee you we would all be saying <laughs> that be is a an act of war. Yeah, yeah. The, the only reason that Syria didn't declare war on us in response to that attack was they know they'd be obliterated. They've already got their hands full with all these U.S. backed rebels over there, and they can't do it, take on the U.S. military. So they they didn't declare war on us. But that would normally be cause for that. And I just want to say one thing, too, uh, for diehard Trump supporters who say, well, I think that uh, his commander in chief, that he has the right to launch missiles on his own discretion without conferring with Congress. Well, by that logic, OK, by that logic, he has the right to launch uh, missiles, uh, nuclear missiles on Russia. Right. And start World War Three and kill every man, woman and child on the planet. 
And does anybody really think the founding fathers intended the president to be invested with that kind of authority? No, they were anti-king, they were anti-autocrat. Obviously, this was un unconstitutional, and Trump knew it by his own admission in his tweets. And you know what? I have a feeling, James, in my perspective of this whole thing with the airport, the bombing of the airport, mm. none of those tomahawks hit, like, there was four, 59 tomahawks. None of them hit the actual runway. And people go, oh, you got to preserve the runway, and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, that's why you send missiles to an airport to blow up the actual landing surface. So that happened. And then they're like, well, we're going to hit the buildings that had the uh, chemical weapons in them. That's a stupid idea, too. Like, if it's chemical weapons, let's blow them up and like get that all in the air for everybody to breathe. So I, I think them sending all those missiles and not hitting the airport and not even hitting an airplane, they, I think it was just a show. I think it obviously was just a show. And I think I heard that, I know that um, Clinton had said two hours before the attack to bomb the airports. She had made that very clear on Twitter and Facebook and everything else. I saw it all over the place. And then, um, so then the attack happens and then the airport's still there and, you know, everything's basically as it was. And I really thought it was just a way of getting the message across that, yeah, we have all these weapons we could use. Well, so he didn't really, he really didn't, he the, didn't do anything. Yeah. The other thing that I heard too, is that these were old uh, tomahawks and that they weren't really, they have newer, better ones. And so this was a way to kind of eliminate old stock too. And, uh, you know, oh, bolster convenient. the yeah. uh, stock of, you know, Raytheon and Boeing and all those guys, all their, all their share prices, you know, took off and went higher, you know, mm. once. Uh, naturally, naturally. Yeah, so I, I think it was just a way of turning over old stock. And, uh, you know, they got to rotate the stock and get the new stuff out there. So, But they got everybody riled up that night. I didn't sleep at all. I was all fired up. And then I realized, wow, we just got played. But go on, James. I want to hear what continue, because what you're saying is really important. Okay. Well, my third reason is that he acted with complete haste. He didn't wait for the facts to come in. Uh, he had uh, some photos that Ivanka cried over and he got an intelligence briefing. But you remember with uh, Saddam Hussein and the weapons of mass destruction, that Colin Powell had many intelligence briefings and he gave the UN an intelligence briefing and he had diagrams and charts and evidence and testimony and it all turned out to be false. Yeah. And so he had a chance to vet that for a long period of time. He was totally wrong. Colin Powell has admitted it was wrong. He's admitted that he had faulty intelligence so why does Trump act with haste? You know, in, in America, if somebody's accused of a crime, we give them a trial. We, we wait for the facts to come in. We, we hear both sides of the story. We have an investigation to turn up everything. We don't just hang a person upon an accusation. But that's what he did. He decided, I'm going to hang Assad. Good enough for me. Um, so this was uh, based on uh, inadequate evidence and apparently, uh, you know, last time uh, when Obama asked for congressional approval, they decided we're just not even going to bother. That. We're just going to go ahead and play our hand now. But he didn't wait for the facts to come in. And uh, well, as, as, as more facts come in, we're finding out that it wasn't Assad. But that was point number three, that the impetuous reaction, uh, which was very unpresidential, despite uh, the, the that word presidential being used in the media to describe him. I, I got to go out and uh, talk. You know, we had a town hall meeting with my my local congressman uh, Tim Waltz, a Democrat, and I was really surprised because he was all for. He said, "Oh yeah, Assad's gassing his own people," and I, you know, I just blurted out. I said, "Why would he do that?" And he started out this town hall, you know, talking about the importance of open dialogue and how we need more of it. But he shut me down <laughs> right away. He wouldn't let me say, well, what about the last two times that Assad was supposed to have gassed his own people? And we found out that he, no, he didn't. Uh, and so why would he do that? But no, everybody yeah. just shut me down, you know, so I, I was really pretty disappointed at that point. I was well, actually pr pretty excited because here in Rhode Island, the Providence Journal did a... a an interview with Syrian Americans, you know, people of Syrian descent. And a lot of people stood forth and said, I, I support Assad. He's great because it's, you know, secular there. And you can be any religion there. 
Um, the education system under him was wonderful. Every kid got a laptop. All this stuff was going. And then they're just devastated that this is going on. They do not believe that he gassed those people. Yeah, and an important distinction to make is, uh, you know, apparently there was some gas released, but uh, in my uh, my uh, web article of, uh, embedded an interview with Peter Ford, the former ambassador to Syria, talking to the BBC. The BBC thought he was going to bash Assad, and he stuck it in their face, and he said, I don't leave my brains at the door. And he pointed out the distinction here. Okay, chemical weapons, but was it uh, Assad's Air Force dropping chemical weapons, or did a conventional bomb strike convention, uh, chemical weapons used by the rebels on the ground? Yeah, both possibilities. To date, the Trump administration has provided no proof whatsoever that it wasn't the latter. And I've also got an interview in there. These are short clips, but it's a British journalist named Tim Duggan, who lives in Damascus. And he affirms that that is the report. That what they hit was chlorine. They used a conventional bomb to bomb an Al-Qaeda site. And the, it was, they hit the, the store of chemical weapons, chlorine gas that the rebels were using. So Trump attacked the wrong people. Again, he should have waited for the facts to come in. Uh, wait a second. So we've got Al-Qaeda roaming around. Now, what about ISIS? Yeah, that's the thing. I, I just did a meme where Tillerson's being asked, what do we do uh, with Syria's moderate rebels? And he says, we back them. What do we do with the extremist rebels, ISIS? We bomb them. Well, what if they're halfway between moderate and extreme? And then he says, well, we bomb them and we back them. And that's about that's the craziness of U.S. policy there. You know, we have Al Qaeda there, the, the, and they're, they're linked to the Al Nusra front and the, the White Helmets. But you've also got Daesh and ISIS and how you distinguish. They all want to overthrow Assad. That's the main thing. And, of course, the U.S. Uh, backs the moderate rebels, but also if you listen to, to Michael Flynn or Ron Paul, they both went on record saying that the U.S. created ISIS to begin with. Right. Um, so, again, our policy there is insane, and Trump was correct the first time around in 2013 when he said we should just stay out. By the way, right. we've only touched on three of my 14 reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep going, James. <laughs> I mean, just keep you know? going on and on. Oh, man. Well, so, reason number four. Reason yeah, number going. four, the United States was not attacked. And, you know, the, what's the purpose of our military? The purpose of our military is supposed to be to defend America. We were not attacked. The purpose of the military is not to go around the planet and kick ass and uh, punish people we don't like or that the president doesn't like or right other people's wrongs, which we may be incorrect, as we've already been seen in our interpretation of. So it violated the purpose of the U.S. military. It, we're supposed to be defending America. What are we doing going bombing Syria over an internal matter? This is another, you know, Smedley Butler, you know, war is a racket. And <laughs> yeah. it appears that what's, that's what we do now. We just go beat people up and steal their stuff. You know, that's pretty disappointing. And that's a good point. This is going on in Smedley Butler's time, you know, in uh, 1940. I think that was the year he died. He was the highest decorated Marine in U.S. history. He was a, he was a general in the Marines. Uh, rose up the ranks, uh, but uh, he exposed the and the way it was working. But the way it was working back then, you know, bankers' wars, same same then as it is today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's well, a uh, well. Yeah, keep going with your list. <laughs> you you yeah, got ways to go. The list can so. take up the whole hour. So I want to hear this. Keep going. Okay, uh, and we'll try not to take up the, the whole hour. But reason number five: the chemicals could not have been sarin gas. And you can look this up. There's a former colonel in the Defense Intelligence Agency. His name is Patrick Lang. And he says that the missile strikes were, quote, based on a lie, quote. And he goes through a number of reasons, but he points out why this could not have been sarin gas. Quote, we know it was not sarin. How very simple. The so-called first responders handled the victims without gloves. If it had been sarin, they would have died. Sarin on right. the skin will kill you. How do I know? I went through live agent training at Fort McLennan in Alabama. So that's reason number five. This couldn't have been sarin gas, as they claimed. So it was obviously, as they were, as the people on the ground in Syria are saying, this, this was chlorine gas. It was the homemade chemical weapons used by the rebels, not sarin gas. Right, right. Because you can see those pictures online. These people are not outfitted in, you know, the full biohazard stuff. Yeah, and they're doing selfies and, you know, yeah. it's, so, it's so ridiculous. Um, well, reason number six, you kind of, kind of uh, uh, Rob, you kind of touched on this. But reason number six was... The past attacks, okay, Seymour Hirsch had already done an investigation, which is suppressed in the U.S. media, but it was published overseas, and he found that the uh, the original sarin gas, the 2013 one, that was not Assad doing that. 
first of all, the he found that the British British laboratories that tested the sarin gas fund was not the kind that uh, Assad's uh, military stockpiled. He also did interviews and found uh, that uh, the Turkish intelligence had collaborated with the Syrian le- rebels to, to, to in that original sarin gas attack. And now that's been confirmed by the Turkish media. Okay, so we know that the first one was false. So how much credibility does this one have? I can't remember who I heard uh, mention that too. That all of these ke- chemical uh, weapons basically have—they're like you know—they they're almost like a fingerprint. They can trace down to where they came from. Mm. Uh, just should with, with modern tech, yeah. Yeah, with modern tech, you can do forensic investigation, find out you know where you know who produced these things. <laughs> Are they something that the chem- uh, the rebels could you know? Do it in their chemistry set, you know, go to the drugstore, pick up a few items and go back home and make them. Uh, I don't think so. You know, so anyway, let's continue on with the list. OK, number seven. Here's a quote from uh, the Britain's Daily Mail uh, headline this is from 2013, quote, U.S. backed plan to launch chemical weapon attack on Syria and blame it on Assad's regime. Sub uh, headline leaked emails from defense contractor refers to chemical weapons, saying the idea was pro- approved by Washington. And it goes on. And by the way, the Daily Mail has deleted that article, but people have preserved it. Global Research has the full article online. So there's another strike. The U.S. wanted to launch a ad- chemical attack and blame it on Assad. That's historical. That should have been taken into account in this accusation. Mm-hmm. Well, OK, reason number eight. Assad had no motive. Uh, I think what he had more none. Than, he had no none. motive. And everything was going great between the United yeah. States and okay, continue. Yeah, Russia and Assad's army had won a big victory in Aleppo. During all that time, they never used chemical weapons against the military on, on the battlefield. So why, all of a sudden, we're on the brink of victory, out of the blue, he decides let's just drop some chemical weapons on innocent civilians, knowing full well what happened the last time there was a sarin gas. Uh, chemical weapons accusation and brought in U.S. military intervention. Why would Assad do that? There is zero motive. When you look at a crime, you ask who was motivated, who was motivated. The, it's the guys who just lost in Aleppo. They want to get the upper hand again. What better way than to have the U.S. launch an airstrike? Right. And of course, the pictures you see are all children. They all have their shirts off and they're all they all look you know quite helpless, you know, half dead or dead. And it's very moving. It's not just like normal people that happen to be walking around doing whatever they do in life. This is almost all children. Well, you know what? The powers of be know that children's stories really tug at the heartstrings. That's why yeah. they had the, the baby incubator stories. And that's yeah. why during World War I, they made up stories about German soldiers cutting the hands off children when mm-hmm. after the war they found out that that never happened. So mm-hmm. this is part of the... Uh, the media psychology, they did it to children, they did it to babies, you know. Yeah, it kind of pumps people up, like, oh, I'm a warrior, I'm going to help these ho- helpless people. Yeah, I'll enlist, yeah, that's yeah. that's always been the logic. They, they keep playing the same game. Okay, yeah. reason number nine, okay, right after the U.S. strike on Sherat Air Base, ISIS launched a new offensive. So Trump came to power saying he's going to stop ISIS. What does he do? He launches a flank attack in support of the ISIS army in Syria. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. Mask is coming off. Yeah. Okay, reason number 10. And you touched on this, uh, Rachel, but uh, it, it's such an important point. I'll bring it up again here. If, in fact, there were chemical weapons at that airbase, launching an airstrike makes no sense. You know, the last time when, when uh, Assad did turn his chemical weapons over to the U.S. military, they disposed of them by dumping them in the ocean. That would be the proper way to dispose of chemical weapons. If uh, a U.S. Tomahawk missile hits uh, a supply of chemical weapons, it will release them into the atmosphere, kill civilians, which is supposedly the whole thing that Trump and Ivanka were so upset about. So they're right. actually doing the very thing they said they shouldn't do. So yeah. that means either Trump had really bad uh, military advice or they knew full well there were no weapons at that airbase, chemical weapons. <laughs> I think it's funny. The proper way of getting rid of chemical re- weapons is to just dump it into blow the them ocean. Up. Blow them up into <laughs> yeah. the atmosphere. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, really good that, idea. Yeah. I mean, it not. gets the, it gets stupider as you go along. Uh, number 11 is one that you mentioned, which is that Hillary, I, I call this Trump is keeping bad company. Hillary said hours earlier that they should take out the, uh, the Syrian airfields. And right now he's in company with Obama, uh, the neocons, uh, Lindsey Graham, 
John McCain. This is the guy we didn't win on. We he this is the, we wanted the non-interventionist he presented himself as as a candidate. Instead, he suddenly he's totally in with a neocon crowd. Well, for all listen, Henry Kissinger is still floating around. <laughs> yeah. Like, what is this? How I? Why is this guy not dead? And I don't mean to sound just harsh, but honestly, this guy cannot go away. And here he is floating around talking about Syria. This is in 2013. He was talking about the balkanization of Syria. That's the idea. That's and, the yeah. idea to, to divide it up. And, yeah. and that was, uh, you know, about Kissinger, that was one of the things that Jack Blood brought up was that now uh, Kushner will be his last student, you know, that uh, he's following him around. and uh, that, the Younger generation, yeah, pass your knowledge on. <laughs> and pass the knowledge on. So that was something that I asked. Uh, I, who did who did we have on when I asked who's going to re, uh, re... I think I asked I, uh, I think Catherine. it was... Uh, Catherine Austin Fitz. Yeah, I said, who's going to replace? Oh, yeah, I said, let's look at Economist Magazine. <laughs> yeah, and see who's the next one's coming up. Well, there's the answer. They're going to train in uh, Jared Kushner. will take uh, Kissinger's yeah. place. So who's going to take uh, uh, Zabig's uh, place? You know, I, I don't know. You know, he, he looks a little bit healthier than, uh, uh, you know, than Kissinger. But uh, I don't know. Maybe that's what Morning Joe is there for, getting all the briefings from mm-hmm. <laughs> Zabig News' uh, daughter. So. I don't know. Oh, and speaking of bad company, uh, what was really amazing to me was, um, you know, the the mainstream media was bashing Trump during the election, after the election, and then, but then, I had CNN on on April the 9th after the airstrikes, right. and it was amazing. CNN was talking with this humble reverence about Trump, how he had uh, restored America's respect throughout the world, and I'm sure you've heard the clip of... Um, Brian Williams talking about our beautiful weapons and quoting a yeah. poem about it. Yes. And I said, have I got the right station? Is this CNN? And, and uh, I don't have that clip that I watched, but I put another one on there where they're saying that Trump has now become presidential. And all of a sudden, the, I don't know if this honeymoon will last, but all of a sudden, mainstream media was in love with Trump for doing mm-hmm. this. And all the pressure was off him. Yeah. I was at a doctor's appointment this past weekend. They had the flat screen TVs. You cannot escape television yeah any, anywhere, anywhere. even anywhere. at a gas so here, station now right yeah right <laughs> no, so i'm sitting there like trying to deal with my medical stuff and it's just like they're oozing about how presidential and great trump's doing with his foreign relations and you know i think he was meeting with the uh, italian president and they were just all over themselves i believe it was cnn they just were really really just <laughs> praising him about how great a president he was being i was like wow what the heck just happened they turned off a switch you know, it's like uh, Evelyn the Rochelle t- hit the switch, and all of a sudden, they they're transformed. They're just the media just completely transformed. Mm-hmm. Oh, I made a meme of uh, Anderson Cooper calling uh, Trump a, a, a sexist, racist pussy grabber, right? And then um, uh, he's talking to Wolf Blitzer, and Blitzer says, "Oh, he just bombed Syria." And then uh, <laughs> uh, Anderson Cooper says, "As I was saying, Trump is truly presidential and be recalled as one of history's most noble statesmen." <laughs> That's what happened. That really literally happened. It was like, oh, that's just like with a, in a flash, they turned. And that was the same way with my congressman. He, you know, he said, well, I wasn't, you know, on Trump's corner until, you know, this Syria thing. But he did the right thing. And, and once again, it was because uh-huh. we have to protect the women and children. Any ruler that attacks their own women and children, uh, you know, look at look at this place. You know, what are what are we doing to our kids? We're just doing the slow uh, chemical uh, attacks on our yeah. Women and yeah. children. Vaccines. But yeah. actually, that brings me to point number 12, uh, which is the hypocritical double standard. Because if you look at what our allies are doing, Saudi Arabia is bombing Yemen. There's millions of people at risk for starvation. Even uh, CNN has acknowledged that, that. They have bombed hospitals, airports, even weddings and funerals. I've um, got clips of this. And plus, how about a speed of chemical weapons? Israel drops white phosphorus over densely populated uh, regions of uh, civilian regions of Gaza, which is a violation of the G- Geneva Convention, is a div- uh, violation of the international rules on chemical weapons use. And uh, I've got pictures of the victims there. So why didn't Ivanka shed tr- uh, tears over that? Why isn't Trump going to punish Saudi Arabia and Israel, our allies, for their human rights abuses? They're using chemical weapons on, on civilians. And that's documented. That's been going on for years 
whereas this was something that just happened. He got some fly-by-night photos uh, that Ivanka cried over, and you launch start a war over that. So this was a total double standard. And since he's not reacting to what's going on in Yemen and Gaza, I have to say, no way was this airstrike motivated for the reason they said, which was humanitarian concern. Right, right. Not to mention the the before and after of our you know engagement with Libya. I mean, uh, right? I used yeah, to, one yeah, constant pattern. Yeah, I used to you know believe the mainstream narrative that you know that Omar Gaddafi was uh, uh, you know was this monster, and but it turns out that you know he actually did a lot for the country of Libya, and uh, the people there loved him also. So. Yeah, we. Uh, <laughs> I guess it goes back to uh, uh, generals. Uh, that list of the seven countries we were going to take off, uh, uh-huh. take out in five right. years. So, that's a key clip. That Wesley Clark clip when he said in two thousand and one was already a plan in the Pentagon to take out seven nations, including Libya, Iraq, and Syria. Yeah, we're seeing that all happen now. And of course, they had to have a pretext to take out each country. So they invented the, the weapons of mass destruction and the sarin gas attacks. It's all. I, it's I all think it actually is moving much slower than they thought it was going to happen. I thought for they, them. I think they thought it was going to happen like bang, bang, bang right after 9-11. Don't you feel sorry for them that they didn't get to take out these countries as fast as they wanted? I mean, you know, I, be, <laughs> no, I bet but some... I, re- I really do think they thought they would do it much quicker, but it, it's, it's dragged out for them. Partly probably due to the effect of uh, alternative media waking yeah. people up worldwide. Internet, sure, yeah. sure, the internet. I think so. And I mentioned this article before the show, but I'll bring it up here. You know, Israel makes it official. The destruction of Syria will legitim- legitimize ir- Israeli land grabs. So uh, this was posted over at uh, Republic Broadcasting Network, and it's from Russian Insider. But yeah, that's just, you know, is this whole thing, are these seven countries, is this, you know, part of uh, Israel's big plan? You know, I. I yeah, I, the Greater Israel Project. Right. And if people haven't heard of that, I would, I would recommend uh, going. The best article I've seen in it is if you go to Global Research and look for their article called Greater Israel, they go into the Yinan plan of the 1980s. They go all the way back to the uh, Zionist Congresses of the 1897, began in 1897, which were funded by the Rothschilds, of course, and their plan for Greater Israel and their plan to balkanize uh, the surrounding nations. And that's what this whole Arab Spring thing has been about, along with oil and other motives. Uh- yeah, can I ask a question? Because I'm still sketchy on this whole thing. The greater Israel thing and the Rothschilds. I know this is, could be a whole nother show, but right. I, I still, I really don't understand what this, this name, Rothschild, what it is they want to have happen. You know, uh, we were talking about this. Um, we, we won't have time to go into it, but there's yeah. this banker. It's huge. It's huge. Uh, uh, named Ronald Bernard, who has just given one of the, I consider it the most compelling whistleblower interview ever, but he talks about how the elite, and this is his own personal testimony, they engage in child, child sacrifice and they are Luciferians. And the, the, the Rothschilds are the top of the Luciferian pyramid, but if you want to know the connection to Israel, they were buying up land in Israel in 1829. Um, we're talking uh, almost two centuries ago, uh, the Balfour Declaration by which Britain f- promised to form a Palestinian state for the Jewish homeland was issued to Lord Walter Rothschild. Uh, James de Rothschild, I believe it was, yeah, James de Rothschild bought up so much land in Israel for the Zionist cause that he was put on their 500 shekel note. And the Israeli Supreme Court, which is filled with Illuminati symbolism, including a, a pyramid on top of the building with an all-seeing eye, was funded by the Rothschilds, so they're up to their neck in Israel. It's like their proxy state. And if you look at the statements made by David Ben-Gurion, who was Israel's first prime minister, um, let me give you an exact quote um, from Ben-Gurion. He said, quote, isn't it only fitting that Jerusalem be the seat of the United Nations cultural bodies, human rights organizations? Isn't it only proper that Jerusalem be the place where the members of all faiths convene to announce their reading of of war. And so he's envisioning that the capital of world government would be be Jerusalem. And there's many other quotes on that from uh, Zionist leaders. But every every government has a uh, capital. The capital of world government is supposed to be Jerusalem. It has spiritual significance to the Luciferians. And let me give you just one Bible quote on this. It's from two Thessalonians. 
Uh, it says, quote, do not, this is written over 2,000 years ago, mind you, it says, quote, do not let anyone deceive you in any way for that day, meaning the final day, will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, meaning the Antichrist, is revealed. Uh, he will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God. Uh, so he sets himself up as God in God's temple, that means Jerusalem, proclaiming himself to be God. So that's right from the Bible. So this whole thing is a long term. It's more than just, uh, you know, rich bankers want to get richer. There is a spiritual component to this. And uh, for reasons that are laid out by themselves and in, in, in Scripture, uh, their goal is when they take over the world, they want the capital to be Jerusalem. And that's what in a greater Israel is making the world safe for wiping out all of Israel's enemies so that that capital can exist uh, unmolested by enemies. How big does Israel have to be? <laughs> it shouldn't be there at all. Is it the whole wide all. world? Is it the whole wide world? I, I guess I mean, big, according I think, to this, I, I think big enough so that all of our surrounding uh, potential enemies are eliminated, and that's what we've been taking out: Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, Syria, and of course Iran would be last on the hit list. Well, I think uh, I think they're done with America once they get rid of Iran. If they, we take out Iran for them, I think they're going to say goodbye, America. We don't need you anymore. To, yeah, you know, you're you're let... addicted to opioids and drugs and everything else. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, isn't that what the Israel flag is to it? It's got the two wavy blue lines on it. That uh... yeah, yeah. The, the uh, Israeli flag has the uh, the Greater Israel goes from the Nile to the Euphrates, and the Euphrates is the, is the blue line on the top of the Israeli flag. The Nile is the bottom blue line. In between that, they've got a six pointed star with six triangles and a six-sided hexagon, which is 666. Six, six. If you need any more um, uh, relating this to uh, biblical uh, prophecy, uh, you've got 666 six, six right in the middle of the Israeli flag and the symbols of greater Israel. Uh, we mentioned Joyce uh, at the start of the show, and I know one of her sayings that she would you know, come back to every uh, now and then, and she'd say, you know, the bad guys read the Bible also. And so right. I that's think what that's what this uh, whistleblower, this banker was saying, that uh, they're not atheists. They 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 believe in God and they, they believe in uh, they're fighting on Lucifer's side. Yeah, that was a great interview. You you have to you know, it's subtitled, so you have to, to read it. And uh, so but uh, yeah, I, I'm going to try to get that woman that did that interview. And I sh I'm pretty sure she speaks English. And I'm going to see if we could interview her because I don't know how she got a hold of him. That was an amazing interview. I recommend that everybody watch that. I've been tweeting that out and saying, you know, because it comes from the top. It comes from a guy who is a very high currency exchange uh, dealer, um, really uh, very close to the, he says there's like 8,000 to 8,500 people who run the world. He was very close. He said, that she asked him, do you have to know what's really going on or do they compartmentalize your information? He said, well, a lot of people are compartmentalized, but they really couldn't compartmentalize me because I was at a level where you can't make mistakes when you're carrying out their orders. So he was very close to the top. And uh, you look at his face and his emotions during this interview, and you know it's genuine. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's very compelling. And, and yeah, he talks about, you know, he, he was a successful businessman. You know, he's a uh, he had started all these businesses and then somebody that was helping finance them says, well, you know, why are you messing around doing it uh, that way with these businesses? Why don't you just go directly and uh, trade the currencies themselves? That's where the real money is. And so he was very good at it and, and worked his way to the top. But they said, yeah, it's part of the whole, he said it's part of the whole blackmail thing. You have to, they have to have stuff on you. And that's why, uh, it, to keep you loyal, you know, you have to participate in, in these rituals. And the rituals, you know, include sacrificing children. And, and that's when he broke down. He said he couldn't, uh, he couldn't keep his conscience in a freezer anymore. And that's what you need to do is you just have to be very icy and not let the stuff get to you. And it, it got to him, so... Uh, they were, oh yeah, <laughs> getting ready to do a child sacrifice. Yeah, oh, God. Yeah, and you know this is coming out all over the place, and apparently this has been going on for you know thousands of years, and so maybe there is a Luciferian thing to it. You know, I. Well, it also links into this whole Pizzagate, Pediogate mm -hmm. stuff, you know, and it's interesting. I, I was going to do a Thai color report, but it's okay. We don't have to because I typed it up and it's not really edited very well. But that, when we start talking about this child thing, the only time I didn't see Trump in a red power tie 
over the past, honestly, since the Syrian assault on the airport, us bombing the airport. He's always been in a red power tie. The only time I didn't see him was in the Times of Israel. They had an article about him, and he was wearing a blue and white striped tie in the White House with this woman, Aya Hajazi. And she, with her Egyptian husband and six others, they were accused of sexual abuse of children at the foundation that the couple ran. And this was in Egypt. And Trump went over and got her back. And he had her at the White House. And um, the name of their foundation was called the Belady Foundation. And it was founded in 2013. However, it was never properly, properly registered as a non-governmental organization, which made me think of the Clinton, organi- the Clinton Foundation, which was you know, never properly I mean, it was set up, the Clinton Foundation, as we learned from Charles or- Ortel, our guest Charles, Charles Ortel, he told us that that was set up for to create a library, the Clinton Library. But then they were marching all over the world, doing all sorts of stuff, moving money all around. Well, anyhow, this Belady Foundation, they had multiple people coming forward about sexual abuse claims. And this woman was in jail for three and a half years. And then Trump went over and got her out. And I think that story happened right the same day that your story that we're talking about, about this banker and the child sacrifices hit. And, which I think is interesting. And, you know, this goes back to, I mean, the the Franklin scandal, the Franklin cover up and, uh, you know, Boys Town and Father Flanagan and all that stuff. I mean, you know, they had a... I mean, Congress at least, you know, pretended to have investigations and hearings, you know, and it's the same with thing with Oliver North, whatever comes of these things, you know, uh, they they have the investigations and uh, and nothing comes of it. And now they uh, now they're just completely ceremonial. They don't really function as they're supposed to at all as far as Congress and that. Uh, what do you yeah. take of uh, I was just I was just going to say on top of this whole thing, Trump. But now Trump has pumped up um, Egypt's uh, aid that we give them. I guess you call it aid, but it's to 1.3 billion in military aid under Trump. Oh, yeah. This is coming from the guy who said that uh, our allies are going to have to pay their own defense costs. Right. So we get somebody out for sexual abuse, brings them back to the White House, and then meets with the president of Egypt and gives them 1.3 billion in military aid. Yeah. <laughs> um, why don't we uh, just? Um, You've got a couple uh, more on I'll, your I'll list get, there, or and finish. Yeah, it. we can uh, just to uh, uh, keep it on uh, the original track too. I'll, I'll just finish off the uh, reason yeah, why yeah, yeah. these Syria airstrikes were a bad idea. This is reason number thirteen, and okay. actually could be number one on the list, which is the attack has drawn us closer to World War Three. Yes. Um, as you know, uh, we often get involved in major wars due to an incident. For example, uh, you got the Spanish-American War, allegedly because of the sinking of the Maine, right? Or the Lusitania incident brought us into World War One. That was the incident. And the Tonga Gulf incident brought us into Vietnam. So if we start getting more deeply involved in Syria, the very thing Trump said he didn't want to do, uh, with Russian forces there, all it would take would be an incident, uh, a clash between American and Russian forces, and you'd have some Pentagon spokesman uh, saying that the Russians did it, and Trump saying that uh, we cannot tolerate you know, deliberate acts of aggression by Russia, and tensions mounting, and perhaps culminating in a major war uh, with Russia. And so that was reason number 13, the risk of a third world war. Yeah, yeah and we seem to get be getting ever closer, so I'm... Uh, it's I like, don't... how much closer could we get at this point? Yeah. I mean, honestly... Some people say it's worse than any time during the Cold War right now. Yeah, I, I think so. And just kind of ties into it. This is the 14th reason. And I'm, I'm, I could we could have given uh, more, but the 14th reason in my post was the timing of the attack. Uh, I considered suspicious in that there are a lot of we're talking about the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds have a lot of anniversaries that they would consider things to celebrate this year. They're it's the 50th anniversary of the Zionists taking over Jerusalem or, or uh, seizing part of Jerusalem. It's the 50th anniversary of their attack on the USS Liberty. It's the 100th anniversary of our going into World War One. The 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, by which 
you know, the uh, Britain promised to create a Jewish homeland in Palestine. It's the 100th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, which the Rothschilds financed and created the first communist state. It's uh, 100th anniversary of the publication of the Schofield Reference Bible, which is significant because that was the book that birthed Christian Zionism, you know, Christian support for Zionism. It's the 300th anniversary of the founding of the first Freemasonic Grand Lodge, London, 1717. And it's also the 500th anniversary this year of the Catholic Protestant split, which from the viewpoint of Luciferians, divide and conquer, right? Divide the Christian church. Now, Trump's attack on Syria was on April the 6th. That was exactly to the day, the 100th anniversary of America entering World War I. On April the 6th, 1917, we declared war and ended World War I. On April the 6th, 2017, Trump bombed Syria, a possible first step towards our entering a World War III. Hmm. Uh, when Jack was on, he mentioned this uh, time period in history too. If you know, from the nineteenth to uh, to May first as being when uh, you know all sorts of weird stuff goes on. So uh, you know, we yeah, uh, Rachel tweeted about that recently. Um, yeah, well, uh, all you uh, for people of the Gen X Gulf War generation, we experienced March twentieth to May first, and what was it, two thousand three? That's when Operation Iraqi Freedom was. That's when everybody stormed into Iraq. And then it turned into Operation Enduring Freedom, and then it just turned into this thing that lasted forever. It was still there. <laughs> it just, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, James, have you ever, uh, you know, thought about the, you know, the, the relevance of, you know, the, the, the Museum of Baghdad was actually absolutely looted overnight and, you know, <laughs> that, uh, whatever that initial strike was, but they took out all the, you know, it's like one of the oldest museums in the world. And then, you know, it's looted overnight during, during our attack of Iraq. Have you ever looked into any of that at all? Or is that something you're. Only uh, reading some uh, online articles about it. I've researched it in depth, but you know, it seems that every war involves looting, uh, you know, the Spanish American war national city bank, which is run by the Rockefellers took over Cuba's sugar industry, which is the largest sugar industry in the world at that time. Uh, world war one, the banksters and the industrialists looted the American public of $6 billion worth of munitions that were never even manufactured or sent to the front. They, uh, simply folded that money into their own companies. And, you know, it, every war there's looting that goes on. And I'm sure that that was one of the multiple objectives of the Iraq war was to gain the, you know, the gold, the wealth, uh, et cetera, of the wreck. Yeah. And once again, war is a racket. So, and, uh, I think mm -hmm. once again, war is a racket, uh, this medley, you know, Butler quote, and even, you know, and it's, it's amazing how much it's kind of, uh, echoed in, uh, John Perkins, uh, confessions of an economic hitman of, you know, they, <laughs> yeah, either you play ball with uh, this, you know, whatever they're calling it now, the shadow government, the uh, the puppet government that, you know, that, you know, the rest of them are, you know, either either you play their game or they'll, you know, they'll, they'll first bribe you. And if that doesn't work, they'll send in the jackals. And if that doesn't work, they will send in the army and take out, you know, take you out that way. So, uh but yeah, we've been playing Assad as the bad guy for all this time, and it turns out that is people like Rachel mentioned the uh, the people from Syria that you know were interviewed locally there said no, we like him. He was he was good. He's good for the people. So, and a very important point to make is that from a, you know spiritual perspective, uh, you know a Syrian girl is also called Parson Girl has a terrific video called Why the New World Order Hates Syria. She gives eight reasons, including the fact that they have no IMF debt, they don't have a Rothschild Central Bank, they don't have uh, GMOs, um, they have lots of oil and natural gas, even more that's been recently discovered. Um, but one of the main reasons she gives also is that they're secular, you have freedom of worship, which now uh, you're not getting in some of these other uh, theocratic uh, Islamic states that have emerged out of the Arab Spring, as well as Israel itself. But uh, the Christian church has been functioning in Syria. In fact, according to the Bible, uh, the phrase Christian was first used in Syria in the Church of Antioch. 
And so we're talking about churches that go back 2,000 years. They are protected by Assad. The Christians in, uh, I go to church with Syrians, by the way. Um, not, no, they're not all Syrians, of course, but well, people from Syria, they love Assad. You know, he protects the churches there. He always has. And, you know, if Al-Qaeda takes over there, the so-called good guys that America is supporting, or Al-Nazra Front or White Helmets or whatever you call them, they're going to uh, persecute and destroy the churches uh, just as has happened in other uh, Middle East nations now. One more reason why Trump supporters who are Christians should think twice about supporting this Syria airstrike and further interventions in Syria. Yeah, there's, um, I want to direct people to Newsbud. Uh, they did an excellent uh, article called The Balkanization of Syria and Iraq, the Roadmap to U.S.-Israeli Hegemon Hege 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 in the That's Middle East. It is, and <laughs> it, it's an excellent overview of what has been going on. And in, it was in 2016, Secretary of State John Kerry was saying, basically, we're going to partition it over. It's going to be better if we partition it by um, religion. Religion. And John exactly. Kerry was saying that in 2016, and he That's... got that. They got that from the Brookings Institute. And oh. the Brookings Institute was saying that in 2015. And this goes back to again that global research article where they. Uh, quote, the Yinan plan, an Israeli plan for the 1980s to balkanize all the surrounding countries. So that's exactly the plan that they're conforming to. And I remember when John Kerry a year or two ago was talking about how we have to divide up Syria. That's what Israel wants. They want these little countries, these little states around them that are so small that none of them can raise a, a military formidable enough to oppose Israel, which, by the way, has recently uh, what is the F-35 fighters are now getting from America. We're building, you know, uh, the Trump campaign said that we're going to increase U.S. military aid to Israel. And I'm saying, why do you need to increase it? We've already taken out their enemies. You know, we've taken out uh, Gaddafi. We've taken out Saddam Hussein. Uh, we've destabilized Syria and Egypt. And it's like, what, how many enemies do they have left that they need even more military aid? They should need less now, not more. Yeah. And you mentioned about how uh, Syria didn't have the Rothschild Central Bank. And what, mm -hmm. there's only a couple other countries left, Iran and, and, and North Korea. And is, there, is that it? Are those the only ones that aren't? Uh... Well, they say that Hungary and uh, what, Iceland have kicked out the, uh, the bankers, too. And I believe that they've, they've appeared on the list of countries without a Rothschild Central Bank as well. But that uh, may give us insight into what's happening with North Korea right now. Supposedly, the president is meeting today with uh, the entire Senate uh, to brief them on developing events in North Korea. And also, aren't they having a huge terror drill in Washington today, too? So I was kind of wondering. Oh, naturally. Sure. That's going on. <laughs> Plus the thing with the nuclear thing over New York City. That's your Gotham Shield. On. Yeah, Gotham yeah. Shield. Sounds like That's something out of Batman, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I guess they do it every year, but, you know, it had to be right at this critical moment, of course. Um, but are there still, of course, when are we actually bankrupt as a nation? Does, doesn't does it uh, run out on Saturday? Isn't that uh, the, <laughs> the day that yeah, uh, they, they have to start shutting down the... Yeah, out about that, too. So I heard that Trump's not even going to mention the wall till September, because he got, he's got to get the budget on target and then i guess they'll just add the wall in later on or something don't you get the impression that come september there'll be another excuse and that that wall will eventually kind of fade in along with other trump promises uh yeah. into oblivion well, you know, I don't watch the, the regular news at all, except that now that the cab company office has a flat screen TV on the wall and, and I go in there in the morning and CNN is on. But, yeah, they are saying Trump is adamant that uh, the, the wall has to be continued, you know, in the budget. It has to be in the budget before he'll sign anything in the law. So and. Uh, I actually uh, asked once again, I asked my, my congressman about uh, if uh, they don't pass a budget, if it resorts to where uh, Trump will have this, you know, be able to allocate spending, you know, the money that is coming into the government that he can choose where to go, where it goes. And uh, Tim Waltz seems to say, yep, that's absolutely right. He will be able to do with <laughs> the money that's coming in whatever he wants to do. So, and that echoes what uh, David Stockman said. So... 
uh, it'll and that be echoes interesting. what uh, it, um, Catherine Austin Fitz said too. Absolutely, yeah. And so she's going to be on next week, right? Uh, yeah, she will be, and she's going to be talking about local action now that uh, things are going to. Well, people are going to physically start feeling the pinch about the money stuff, and she's going to go over what you can do to assess where you live and how it deals with money and how it deals with uh, the history of the place and. She's going to do an overview about where you are on the map and if that place is a good place for you to be when all this starts going down with the money. And if you have to move somewhere, what, what you should research about the new place that you're going to move to. So, um, But mostly I think she wants people to get involved with where they live and get to know their neighbors, which I'm a big proponent of too. Well, James, we have four minutes left. So, are you are you have any other projects that you're working on, or where you have another interview coming up that you're going to? And <laughs> hate the plug other. Oh, well, I, I do have an interview t- tonight uh, uh, on the Rents Radio Network uh, called Shell Games with Scott Bennett. Uh, we'll be talking about some of the same stuff here. But I want to uh, encourage people to listen to your show next week. Your interview with previous interview with Catherine Austin Fitz was amazing. She's a uniquely informed person. She's a whistleblower in her own right, right? Uh, she was yeah. the director of HUD, and she's a very gifted, very informative lady when it comes to uh, finance and deep state. By the way, I remember when when she was on your show, you know, this this is well before the Syria airstrike. She said she thought Trump was part of the deep state. You know, I was still sitting on the fence. but since Well, the yeah, she, she definitely supported him for sure because she's an American. She wants to support the president. But she said definitely... If he if he gets elected, he's only there because somebody some team on the deep state wants him there. Right. And she's she broke it down that there's different, um, you know, different groups within mm. the, the, the different budgets that are moving around that are actually battling it out. And that's why things got so crazy around him. Yeah, I, I I think we're you know living in this changing of the guard. You know, we mentioned Kissinger and uh, Brzezinski. You know, and they're not going to be around much longer. Uh, David Rockefeller has died. So, uh, uh, and you know, Poppy Bush. You know, for whatever. You know, he was in the middle of a lot of stuff. So I don't think either George or Jeb have. Uh, uh, whatever the cunningness that Poppy had. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> well, he was just had, didn't he go back into the hospital again for pneumonia for like the third time? Yeah, he's, uh, <laughs> he's, he's on enough, his way out. Yeah, he shouldn't be around much longer, but I kind of hate the idea of having this giant state funeral where we all worship this guy, you know, and, and I mean, <laughs> one of the the biggest criminal families on the pl- planet, you know, and you know, as far as political wise, you know, they, they're not, you know, they've managed to rip off and steal a lot of money from the rest of us. And uh, I I don't know if the rumors of owning, you know, huge chunks of land down in Paraguay are are true or not, but uh, it is interesting that uh, <laughs> you know, all the stuff the Bushes have been attached to over, you know, the history of. Uh, of the Bushes, you know, going back to the the, the great grandfather and uh, Prescott Bush, and allegedly being uh, Hitler's banker, and uh, you know. So anyway, okay, we're down to uh, a minute and a half left. So uh, Rachel, anything you want to talk about? No, not really. I was I had a very exciting day today, though. I talked to uh, the designer, the the artist, because my books, my Security Through Absurdity series is going to turn into a graphic novel. So that's going to be pretty cool. (laughs) Pretty excited about that. And uh, you were kind of working on a film uh, score also, weren't you? Or is that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm doing a um, Netflix series type thing. It's got to, because there's three books in my series, there'll be three seasons. And we already wrote the uh, pilot episode. And uh, I'm very excited. It's either going to be Netflix or HBO we're going to go with. And we also have a feature-length film based off it. But the feature-length film is nothing like my book. So, And if anybody's interested in my books, it's rachellmackintosh.com slash books. And you'll see my books. You can get them there. 
And we are also have a fan page at Shadow Citizen where people are buying our uh, merchandise and sending in pictures and our T-shirts and that. So please uh, do that. We really appreciate your support that way. It gets helps get the message out, and uh, we like that. So we have some announcements that might be coming up here next week or the week after. But uh, anyway, stay tuned to Shadow yeah, Citizen. Yeah, tune in. <laughs> you have to tune in next week for sure to hear our announcements. And thanks a bunch, James Perloff. Uh, you're a great guest, and we always look forward to having you back and thanks for filling in on such short notice so yeah uh, james you rock thank you so much thanks, well, thanks uh things are always happy they're relevant thanks guys <laughs> Welcome to Shadow Citizen with Rachel McIntosh and Robo Cell.